What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? It's Wednesday, the 25th of August. A beautiful fucking day to be alive. The join is brought to you by, and I'm walking them back to the show. Me undies, the best in the fucking business. I still have 200 pairs of me undies, even though they weren't with us for the last year. I still been wearing their underwear. Why? Because they're the fucking goods, that's why. I love MeUndies. MeUndies are designed to be the softest thing on earth. That may sound like I'm fucking exaggerating, but it's the truth. Softer than a baby's butt. Softer than a feather. Softer than a Carvel cake that's been sitting in the sun. MeUndies signature micromodal fabric literally grows from trees. That means those undies are soft and sustainable. I have all of them from over the years. No holes, no nothing. They're all different cuts because they're cool. They get you different cuts for different butts. That's their motto. Plus, check out their socks, bralettes, loungewear, and of course, the undies. All ranging from extra small to 4XL for you chubby motherfuckers. Me Undies has a great offer for the church. I mean, for the joint listeners. For any first timers, get 15% off your first order and free shipping at MeUndies.com slash Joey. I love these underwear. I fucking wear them every goddamn day. I got every pattern, every design. I still got some in packages. I'm going to have me on. They're going to bury me in fucking me on these. That's how much I love them. They're comfortable. They keep your nuts fucking smelling tremendous. They keep the sweat away. Why? Because of Modal. Micro Modal is fabric that grows on trees and it's just fucking comfortable. So do me a favor. Go to me on these problem free philosophy. If you're not satisfied with any product for any reason, they'll refund or exchange it. No questions asked. That's me undies.com slash Joey. Plus, they're going to give you free shipping and 15% off your first order at MeUndies.com slash Joey. Comfort where it counts. The joint is also brought to you by Zip Recruiter. Listen, things are reopening. The movies, restaurants, people looking for employees. You want a job? Every place is hiring night right now. Forbes Magazine says gyms, hotels, salons are set to go on an epic hiring spree in the first couple of months. Millions of jobs will be need to be filled as businesses keep reopening. How do you hire people fast? You know what I'm trying to say to you. Zip Recruiter. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Joey. You got nothing to lose. Here's the difference with Zip Recruiter. You're not posting a job and waiting for resumes from Joe Schmo to come in. ZipRecruiter has a fancy technology that finds the best people for the job and it helps you get them. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Joey, what are you talking about? I have a small business, listen, for free. Joey, what are you talking about? I have a medium business, for free. This is gonna help you, you understand me? ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Joey. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Joey, J-O-E-Y. Try it for free. It's the smartest way the higher. The joint is also brought to you by my personal favorite CBD Lion from the CBD gummies with melatonin that you sleep like a fucking bear to the bath balls to the cream. You cannot go wrong with CBD Lion. Go to CBDLion.com, read their third party lab results, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It is the most helpful web page out there. I love it because of their web page and the help they give you. Customer Service 101 at CBDLion.com. And the product is tremendous. But it starts with you. Go to CBDLion.com right now. Press in Joey or Joint and get 20% off and you get CBD products delivered right to your crib. Who's better than you? Go with CBD Lion if you want to take care of yourself, your mind, and your body. Let's get this podcast started. We got Tim Dillon on here today. We ain't got time to play games, people. Let's do this.
What's happening, you beautiful motherfuckers? It's Wednesday, the 25th of fucking August. That's it. We're getting close to the fucking Labor Day. The summer's coming to a fucking end, and we're making it happen. I'm still away, but we had time to do the fucking podcast for you, and we got a great guest this week. Uh, it's fucking weird, man. Comedy, you never know anything about comedy. You know, when you get into comedy, you get in there with this blind, you know, you don't want to, you don't know where you want to go. You don't want to raise your head and say, I'm a comic and I want to be a movie star. I'm a comic and I want to have a fucking TV show. You're getting ahead of yourself. You never know where you're going to end up. So when you become a comic, like I did, I just became a comic to become a comic. I didn't become a comic to be on TV. I didn't become a comic to be on HBO. I just wanted a life, and I didn't want to be a fucking criminal anymore. That's the only reason why I got into comedy. It was the last resort for a guy like me. Sometimes, you know, I had no fucking GED. I had a GED. I didn't have anything going on. Then I got the felony, and I knew I couldn't keep beating the fucking same old drum. So comedy was something I could fucking tolerate. If you saw me on stage in 94, could you tell that I was going to be something? No, no, not at all. You know, I couldn't fucking tell. I, I, I was lucky if I would just be able to stay in comedy for 10 years, never mind 30 fucking years. By the time I was doing comedy five years, I had an identity. You know, you, you have an identity. It's like, it's like when you hear three chords on a fucking guitar. You know, you know if it's David Gilmore, you know if it's Jimmy Page, you know if it's fucking, you know, you know if it's the guy from fucking Motley Crue. I mean, you know from their chords. They don't have to tell you Eric Clapton, you know, and that's what happens with stand-up. You start seeing people and you go, wow, that person's getting better, you know. You never think that that person's going to be a star. You could just, that's why I love watching comedy. I always loved watching comedy and watching my friends do comedy because you could tell, like, holy shit, they're going somewhere with this. You, you really don't know, you know. I never judge what the industry said. It was always me watching you on stage going, this motherfucker could rock. This chick's a bad motherfucker here. But I could never really tell then you start getting what's called industry heat which is you know you start going to montreal and, and the moon tower and the festivals or whatnot and you still can't really tell because listen if you saw me in 1998 you would say joey diaz didn't have a fucking chance the same way rogan said it rogan always said that when he met me i was struggling so if you saw me the first seven years in comedy, you would have said, this poor bastard doesn't have a chance. In fact, one of the things that till this day bothers me, and it was my ex-girlfriend, her brother, we went to a show one night, her brother came, and her brother looked at a comic that I was there, and I think he said it to get under my fucking skin, or he said it to, just because he was a fucking moron. He goes, that comic right there is going to go places. And I made a mental note. I was like, I'm going to make a mental note if this guy knew what the fuck he was talking about. I mean, it was 1995. I was only doing comedy four years. I didn't really have any expectations then. But for this idiot to say that this guy was going to be a fucking star in 20 years. So I remember it, it lit a fucking light under my ass. You know, like I'm like, I got to be funnier than this guy. And it also made me stay in touch with this guy. Like I would stay in touch with him over the years. And the result was this. I got somewhere, and this guy's still in this little fucking hellhole doing $50 fucking gigs. You know, the potential was there, but he didn't look at it how I did. I, on the other hand, started off slow and picked up momentum. You know, like I said, in 1998, I was already a regular at the store, but I was a regular because of my presence not because it was going out of my mouth. It was my presence and my energy. That's what pulled me along those fucking days. And I'm really proud of that. You know, I, 
Like, I, I've said it to you guys before. I'm no John Mulaney. I'm no Bill Burr. I'm Joey motherfucking Coco Diaz. I'm a storyteller. I do observational comedy. You know, I improvise, whatever the fuck I do. I wish I could write like those guys, but that's not the way it worked out. Everybody has a different journey on this fucking earth, you know? And with comedy, you never fucking know. You just go. Do you think I can be on TV? I don't fucking know. I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke up your ass and tell you're going to be on TV, you know, but you're not going to be on TV if you don't fucking go for it. That's a start right there. I don't know. You know, the other night we were watching the World Series of fucking softball. My father-in-law called and he's like, it's eight, it's nine to 12 year olds. See if Mercy wants to watch it, you know? And I called Mercy. She had come out of the shower. And we're watching this fucking World Series. The fucking girl was throwing 95 miles an hour. She was 12 years old or some shit, you know. So, I, you know, I could just watch girls softball for 10, 15 minutes. And then I start feeling like a fucking pedophile. But thank God I'm there with my daughter and my wife. So I don't feel even fucking worse than what I do feel. I'm sitting there. I got my sweats on. I'm relaxing. And I'm watching this shit. And I told Mercy, Mercy, it's going to be 9 o'clock in a little while. You're going to have to hit the fucking crib. And she goes, okay, Dad. And finally, she went over, kissed her mom, and she came over to me, and she gave me a kiss. And as she was walking to her bedroom, she turned around, she looked at me, she goes, you know what? One day, I'm going to play softball on fucking TV. And I was like, holy fuck, and my fucking jaw dropped. And I'm like, this is fucking tremendous, Dad. For her, it was kind of the same thing for me. Like, I was playing basketball. I had gotten left back. I was lost. And I was learn trying to learn moves and fucking, you know, different things from watching college basketball and pro basketball. I would be addicted to it. And one day, I'm watching a college game on a fucking Saturday afternoon. And they say something about Jersey City, you know, and it, and I was like, what the fuck? There's somebody on this team from Jersey City? And I remember I went to the courts that Sunday, and I asked somebody. I was watching the NCAAs, and they said there was a kid on there from Jersey City. And my one friend said, yeah, there's a kid on fucking North Carolina from Jersey City. He goes, I forget what his name is. So I was like, fuck it. That Monday was the final game of the NCAA final. It was the end of March Madness. And I'll never forget, I sat by the TV waiting for the game to come on. And it was Marquette versus North Carroll fucking Lina in the finals. Phil Ford, all these fucking players, Jerome Whitehead. But when they brought up North Carolina, they said starting forward, a freshman from Jersey City, New Jersey, six foot seven inches, Mike O'Corran, a fucking Irish kid with bad skin and acne. And I remember when I fucking, you know, because when you hear Jersey City, it's one thing. But to see this fucking beautiful white boy come out with his baby blue fucking shirt and he was number 31 and all of a sudden on the bottom. Because remember, hearing and seeing is two different fucking things. When I saw Jersey fucking city, my head blew up. It was like my daughter tasting black beans for the first time. You could see something wasn't right. She was like eight months old and she was like, da, 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 da. she was stuttering like Lebrano. So fucking... When I saw that, I fucking went nuts. I was like, holy shit, that was my life's inspiration. If I got to tell you what my life's biggest inspiration was, was seeing Michael Corrin that day and Jersey City. Because Jersey City turns into North Bergen. And if a Jersey City kid could be on fucking TV, so can a fucking North Bergen kid. And that's how I looked at it. I had to look at it that way. That inspired me for the rest of my life. The other day I was sitting there and I'm like, I'm thinking of calling my man Jim Haig. He writes for the the one of the Jersey newspapers in Jersey City. He gave me O'Corrin's number about a year ago before the pandemic. And he told me to call. I, I told him, I go, O'Corrin inspired me in ways that I could never be fucking inspired before. And he goes, here's his number. Give him a call. And now I'm fucking embarrassed. But I was embarrassed at the time. But after thinking about what he did for me and shit, I said, fuck it. It's time to call Michael Corrin. So maybe we'll have him on the fucking podcast and we'll talk about how he inspired me and whatnot. He coached the Nets. He's an announcer now. He's great. But that was for my daughter to say that to me the other day. 
I felt like how I felt in the fucking seventh grade when I saw Michael Corman. I knew I was going to do something with my life as crazy as it sounds. And look at years later. Anyway, I'm going, I'm heading up to shoot a TV show. So 50 fucking years later, it panned out for me. Anyway, this week's guest is, uh, you know, I'm getting older. I love looking, well, when I was doing comedy, I love going to the store earlier and watching different comics do their fucking thing, you know. But I really enjoyed, I didn't enjoy the names. I enjoyed the door guys, you know. Uh, there was one guy that used to do Saturdays early. I forget what his name Afalo or something in, in L.A. I forget what his name is. He used to fucking kill me on Saturday nights. I would go down there early, just to, uh, Benny Ruffalo, whatever. Is that his name, Benny? I think, I don't, I don't know. He was just funny as fuck at the store. There were some guys at the store that made me fucking laugh my ass off that you would know if, you know, just store guys and young guys that were just really funny. You know, this... This guy that I had on the podcast this week, I feel that him, Schultz, you know, these guys all have the ticket on fucking comedy. It's just a matter of time before they become stars. Am I jealous? Fuck no. I'm happier for these guys. I'm happy for people when they strive because I want people to strive. My job is to pull people up. About 15 years ago, I met with this dude. I was talking to him at lunch this was before i got back into stand up in the church and he goes you really got to work stand up and be a mentor for younger guys you know give them light because the more light you give them the more light you'll get and he was right this is what rogan has done over the years with his podcast you got to give younger comics light you can't be jealous of them or judge them or say they're gonna suck fuck no you gotta say you know fucking i salute and fucking wishing the best and this guy I called last week, we talked, uh, I, I heard something about him, I checked in on him, and I asked him if he wanted to do the podcast, and we had a great time, so here he is, Mr. Tim Dillon, enjoy. I'll be back at the end of this to check in with you cocksuckers. Tim Dillon, looking good. What's up, brother? How are you? How are you, my brother? Thanks for having me. How are they treating you down in Austin? I'm about out of here, you know. I mean, I'm about I'm I'm little by little about to uh I'm going back to Los Angeles. We just got I got an apartment the other day and then I, I have a house here that I own, but I'm I'm gonna I'm fixing it up and I'm gonna try to maybe rent it out uh and hold on to it for a little bit. Absolutely. Look at it yeah. as an investment. Where are you going? Right. You're on the road, you're doing your stuff. I'm on the road, just recovering from COVID. I got it. I don't know where I got it. I think those bastards in Orange County gave it to me. And, um, you know, I'm still a little beat. I'm a little tired, but I have beat most of it, but I'm a little fatigued. What is it, like four or five days now? I got diagnosed. I, got, I tested positive last Tuesday, last Wednesday, last Wednesday. And now it's um uh, so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Where what is it? Uh, so eight days. It's eight days so far. You know, it's a bitch. It's a little bit of a bitch. It lingers. It lingers. You know, it's a it lingers. It's one of those things where even after you beat it, there's levels to beating it. No shit. Yeah. You gotta take vitamins and stuff. You gotta take all that shit. You gotta just. You got to you got to rest up and build, you know, I'm, I'm walking like three miles a day now, two and a half, three miles a day and just trying to get your energy up, things like that. But I, I was lucky people got it a lot worse than me. A lot of people have gotten a lot worse than you. And that's what I don't understand. Like, I know jujitsu schools. I know a bunch of people that have not gotten it. Yeah. And they're wrestling with motherfuckers every day and getting bit on the neck. And they didn't get, you know, I, nobody has a fucking you know now it that's one of those the variation in our species is one of the reasons that one virus could never take us all down it's very interesting a doctor explained that to me he goes the fact that certain people aren't getting it means that there will be no one virus that'll get everybody so that's interesting it's like he goes 
A, a virus can never take out humanity because some motherfuckers just won't get it. Well, knock on wood, I haven't gotten it yet, but yeah. I'm not, you know, you never fucking know. You, you don't know what, you know, I swam in the Hudson. I went on triple runs and ate that foreign ass on triple runs, that yeah. Montana ass and shit. Yeah. <laughs> if that doesn't build your fucking immune system, nothing will. You understand me? So You've got a very strong immune system. Well, no, nah, knock on wood. We're still not out of the fucking woods yet, you know. But you think about, you know, you've been on planes for 20, or at least for me. I've been traveling for 20 years. God knows what's on those fucking planes. Yeah. You know, and I would always get prepared before I get on a plane. Now I don't want to get on a fucking plane. It's just like yeah. I'm not in a fucking mood right now after 20 fucking years. I hear you. I get it. I don't want to get on a plane either, but I'll have to. But yeah, no, I think that uh, hopefully we're on the way out of this. We're going to have it's going to be a little nasty in the fall. And then hopefully by the time we get to Christmas, New Year's, it's looking better. It's looking real good. And then by the time we get to next spring, uh, we're golden. You think we will be able to sing in our homes this Christmas? Didn't Let's they hope. ban singing last year on Christmas? Oh, they ban. Remember that they ban singing. Yeah, they're not. I don't think they're going to ban anything. I don't think they're going to shut anything down. I think it's just you know we're going to have to learn to live with it. This thing's not going anywhere. You know, in a way, you should be happy. You got it over with. Yeah, you're going to live, and now you can't get it unless it's a different fucking variant. Right, and it will be, but <laughs> it will be. Yeah, yeah. No, it will be. It'll be the, up. God only knows what variants coming next. I'm happy I'm alive, dude. It, it, when I know people, uh, you know, I don't know anyone directly, but I do know people that are, you know, that I know that they're real who uh, died of this, who've died, and who've, you know, have, have not. I uh, made it out, so it's 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 good to just say, "Hey, I I I lived." Now you could really go for it. You know the reason yeah. why I thought about you for the podcast was because yeah. somebody was asking me the other day. They're like, "You know, with comedy, how do you feel about other comics?" And I'm like, "Well, I got to be honest with you. The comics that I met at the store, like the, let's just take the store for example. I cheer for you guys." Like, I'm, I'm an old fucking fart. You know what I'm saying? I got maybe five fucking years left. You know, I enjoy being a dad. I enjoy being home. But I look at you guys, and you guys got the world by the balls now. And I'm sitting here on the sidelines cheering for you fucking savages. Like I told you when you first talked to me about, you know, leaving Austin, I said to you, bro, right. go back to L.A. The team is ready for you. That's it. Yeah. You're, the, you're the next one on the totem pole, you know, if you want it. If well, you want it, you're the next one. It. I appreciate it. You, we think you're a young man. You just need to, to, to realize how young you are. You're young at heart and, and everywhere else. Um, I, yeah, I had to get out of Austin. Austin, uh, you know, I never fell in love with it the way that Joe did or the way that other people did. It just wasn't, it, it, it didn't grab me. It didn't catch me. I, it wasn't for me. I mean, I don't know what people are seeing that fall in love with it, but, they're seeing something and then maybe it's that I'm not seeing it. Uh, but they're, they're, I, I just, you know, I gave it a shot for months, months and months and months. And, uh, you know, it's one of the least favorite places I've ever lived. And I've lived on the East coast. I lived on the West coast. Uh, but living here has been an education because now I say to myself, this is not for me. Well, at least you got it out of the way. Listen, yeah. when it came to me, when Rogan proposed Austin to me, I was very happy at first. I have nothing against Austin. I love I loved going there once a year. Right. We all to, do. We all love it for a few hours. I love that double tree. Yeah. And I love that fucking uh Papa Doe's. You just roll out of bed and walk across the street. I thought that was one of the easiest weeks in the country for me. And I enjoyed right. the people. And I saw what they were trying to do. And yeah. I was, at, at first I told Joe, well, let me just think about it. But I had my heart set on New Jersey. I've been here a year today. Yeah. A fucking yeah. year. So it's like, I just wanted to come to Jersey because I was, I wanted to be around my family. Well, that's it. And you know, everybody, I think somebody told me once, they said, if you're lucky enough, you get to go home. 
This is yeah. what somebody told me once, which I think made a lot of sense. I'm like, I think about that sometimes after, you know, I, I do my thing in LA and, you know, will I end up back on the East Coast? I don't know. But as somebody said to me once, he said, if you're lucky enough, you get to go back home. And I think you were lucky enough. You worked your ass off. You worked really hard. You made a lot of good things happen. And, and then you had the benefit of being able to go back to the place that you grew up that made you who you were. And you have your daughter now and your wife, and you could show them the experiences, you know, that you had growing up there. Well, she's thanked me about a week, uh, two weeks ago, my daughter took me aside, eight years old. And she's like, dad, thank you for bringing me here. Thank you for turning me on to your food. She fucking loves White Castle. You know, she'll ask me twice a week. Can we go to White Castle? You know, yeah. she loves fucking Carvel. I mean, I took her out yeah, Sunday. Yeah. She loves Carvel. She's all over fucking Carvel. Uh, well, yeah, last night she asked me because I took her to a football game. She's like, you know, it's uh, get a Sunday free today at Carvel. I'm like, we're not fucking going to Carvel because I, I take her once a week for her. Yeah, every now and then. Her a little fucking uh, vanilla ice cream soda. Yeah. But even like I could tell how she treats the people I grew up with. Right. In contrast to other people. She really digs them. She really goes out of their way to talk to them. She's at, she asks them questions like, did you go to school with my daddy? You know, so she's really appreciate. That's what made me happy. Right. Right now, I got to be honest with you. I've been having an all right time here. Right. But watching her have a great time makes my dick hard. What's the difference between when you grew up there and now? How? What What are the major changes? You Holy noticed? shit. It's listen, I grew up in a city that was buck fucking wild, no rules. I was getting dressed yesterday in the shower and I was thinking about a friend of mine getting me a job one day and before he left the room he goes, Enjoy your job, you know. And he goes, Don't forget to steal, because if you don't steal, they're gonna know I was stealing. Who the fuck tells you that in a society? So it was buck wild up there. I live an hour from where I grew up. Where I grew up is really fucking populated. It's right across the Hudson River from New York City. So I didn't want to move up there. There was no right. way I was moving up there. Right. I'm in a place now where, you know, it's wide open. There's trees. The other night I was smoking a joint on my front porch, and two deer run, ran in front of me. I thought I was going to have a fucking heart attack, Tim Dillon. Yeah. I thought I was going to shit my fucking pants when I seen those uh, deer in my front porch at a quarter to 11. I got a cup of tea in me and I got half a joint. I'm just sitting and I heard this fucking thing. And the two deer jumped out in front of me and I almost shit my pants. It's a different world, Tim. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a different world, you know. And uh, I'm happy I got to bring her here. I'm happy my wife is here. She's having a great time. My wife had friends. My wife has friends now that don't give a fuck who I am. Right. You know, before she would make a friend and after two weeks, the girl would say, you know, can we bring, give your husband a script? <laughs> and my wife would go, was this what it's all about? And then when my wife tells him no, they stopped talking to my wife. That was LA for my wife. Yeah. That's to see tough. what they could get out of her on her end. And uh, if nothing, move the fuck on, you know? So right. she's in a different place now. She's surrounded with real parents. Yeah, they care these, about their kids. Yeah, these people are not in the... You know, in L.A., people use their kids... They're pimping out their kids ...as a fucking marketing <laughs> fucking tool. Yeah. No, it's just, they, they're pimping yeah. out their kids. Yeah, no, it's crazy. They'll, I know people who have a kid just to put them in Carpenter. Yeah. They don't give a fuck about the kid. Yeah. Carpenter school, for people who don't know, it's in Studio City. Right. And it's a grammar school, but it's where all the fucking celebrities go. Their kids go to school... Yeah. And they have their Christmas party at CBS Radford on the lot. Yeah. A fucking public I get it because I have a godson who's like a quarter Filipino, but we say Chinese because we want him to, you know, higher end. We say Japanese or Chinese. We don't admit to Filipino. But he's a, but he's the chubby baby with the Asian face. I go, let's get him in something. Let's make a couple of dollars here, you know, because... The reality is, is, you know, he, he, the only thing he could be is, is a nurse, really, because his mother's a nurse, Filipino nurse. I said, so let's just make let's get him like he'll drink some juice. He eats the donut. Let's make a few hundred grand off this motherfucker before, because he might grow up to be a beautiful kid, but he also might grow up to be absolutely uh, disgusting. We don't know. So I get it. Like in L.A., like sometimes you just got to make the money while they're young. 
let me tell you something. I remember going to fucking auditions for commercials and seeing like, the, you know, when you go to those auditions, they have eight rooms. Right. And they have one room that's for kids, like kids come. And that yeah. I would sit there and just watch the parents and watch yeah. the kids and fucking get sick to my stomach. Yeah. How the parents would act because the parents are like Pistol Pete's father. Yeah. They're yeah. pushing the kid. They're telling the kid he's got to get this audition. The fucking poor kid wants to play with blocks. Right. You know, he yeah. don't want to well, be some with of those kids adults. are psychopaths. You know, I well, I was an actor as a kid when I was young. I was on Sesame Street. I started in plays when I was like six. No shit. I swear to God. And I legitimately I did. I, I toured around the country with a, a show. My mother went on tour with me. I did a lot of theater. I did a, I did Sesame Street. I did a, stu a NYU student film. I never did anything big. I, I tried out for big shit, but I never got like Home Improvement or any of those big sitcom. I never got them. Um, and my parents were like, they, they weren't good at being a stage mom. Like they should have been pushier and more aggressive, but they weren't. And then every time I would fail at the audition, we would go home through Penn Station in New York City and I would go, can I go, can I go to Dairy Queen? And they would get me a Dairy Queen blizzard and I would eat it like a failure in the waiting room uh, of the Long Island Railroad. And I would get, I would get like, I forget what kind I'd get. I'd get an Oreo or, or Reese's peanut butter cup blizzard. And I would just sit there and eat it like a failure. And then we'd finally take the train home. So it was a tragic thing, but I, I had fun doing it, but I never made it. But you and did then it. at 13, I became a cocaine addict. So maybe it's not good. You started snorting at 13? At 13, yeah. Holy the shit. Summer going into high school. Yeah. Jesus Christ, Tim Dillon. What yeah. haven't you done? I was at my friend Tina DeLuca's house, and we're in Long Island, and she had a nice house on the water. And she goes, we got, you know, me and a couple other friends were there, and you know, they were like, well, let's try cocaine. I said, that sounds like a great idea. And she had it and we did. It didn't even work. I didn't. The first time I said, it doesn't even we had to keep doing it and doing it. And then finally, uh, you know, it, it took you got to drink with it. Yeah. Yeah. It took eventually. But I mean, I was smoking weed. I was doing acid, uh, you know, all of those things. Yeah. First tab of acid. I was in um, my first tab of acid. You're going to laugh. Was at my friend's house. I was in eighth grade. The second time I did acid, I was on the graduation stage of my junior high school. And me and my friend Shay, my friend Tina, we're like a three. Uh, we all took a tab of acid and we were standing there and the valedictorian is up there. Wouldn't shut up some, you know, some Asian girl. And uh, she was talking and talking. And God bless her. But she was talking about, you know, whatever, you know, and we were just standing there. And then finally, we went to the beach afterwards and we were all, we were finally tripping, but yeah, I started really young and then I sobered up at 25. So I had about a 10 year period of, of, of being out and doing wild shit. Now are you sober today? Sober is a church. No drinking, no smoking, no, drinking, nothing. no pills, no weed, nothing. How long now? About 11 years. No shit. Tim yeah, about 11 years. Yeah. The only thing I struggle with is cigarettes. I'm, I'm, I'm not smoking them now, and I don't think I'll smoke them for a while because once you get COVID and you start breathing, you go, motherfucker, I, you know, I don't want to, I, I, I won't go back to cigarettes, but like 11 years of nothing. That's tremendous. It's good. Yeah, I'm, I'm pumped about that. I'm happy about that. It's funny. When I first started doing coke, I was 16 the first time yeah. I did coke. And the first couple times I did it, I wasn't getting high. I thought it was yeah. a joke. That's right. Yeah. I thought it was a joke on me. I'm like, you know how Saturday Night Live people said it was fucking hysterical? I would run home to watch it and go, this ain't funny. Yeah. This ain't fucking funny. You know, uh, um, Samurai. I mean, I love Belushi, but that shit just wasn't funny to me at that age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought it was part of the big joke on Uncle Joey. Like, yeah. it's a big fucking joke. Nobody gets high on this shit. Right. And I would pay another 50 bucks for a half gram. Try it again and nothing. Right. And it wasn't until one night that we mugged Steady Freddy at Putnam Fuel and we got an eight ball that I started drinking Michelob Lights and my jaw started going. And I'm like, finally, after fucking nine months, yeah, I'm getting high on this shit. I threw must, I must have thrown two grand at this fucking dealer yeah. for nothing. It was nothing. But once yeah. I started getting high, it was tremendous. Yeah. Then I we drank love, a lot of the time. I, I loved it.
We used to do it in our office because we were mortgage guys, and it was good to just we'd blast lines right off the desk. Um, how long did you stay up for? How many nights was your record? I think my record was close to three. That's what was my record. Three yeah, fucking close to nights. Three. Think yeah. of how sh- how happy you are now. Yeah. That you're not uh, doing a three day as a fucking comic. Let me tell you something. As a yeah. comic, the worst thing you could have is a monkey on your back. That's true. And go on the road. It's yeah. it's a horrible thing. And I told people that if I still had the monkey on my back, I would have gone on the road every weekend. Right. That's what you do. You right. go on the road, you snort coke, you fucking pick up freaks on the road, and you do what yeah. you do. But thank God. Like, I still remember getting fucking high in Beaumont, Texas, out of all with the weird places, eating 30 Valiums yeah, for the weekends, 10 mil, you know, and just, so the last, my last run on the road was sober, you know, reefer and edibles. Right. But you could, I could still wake up at seven and make radio. It's not like you get coked up and at 6.30, you got to call the radio station and yeah. tell them you're not feeling good. I'm not feeling good. I had some MSG last night. <laughs> you gotta make up some fun. Yeah. You, gotta, you gotta call Jim Norton and tell him at six in the morning. I'm not gonna make it. I had MSG because yeah. that's what usually happened to me. Yeah. And it wasn't even snorting coke. It was just you get off the plane, you're living in California hours, and you come to New York. You're up till four in the fucking morning, right? And they want you in radio at seven thirty. You're like shit. I didn't fall asleep till five last night. Yeah. It must have been the MSG. It was a General Tao's chicken. It was a General Tao's chicken and shit. Yeah, but I'm, I'm happy to not be doing it. Like, to not Absolutely. be doing it is, is good. Absolutely. Man, it blocks you as a comic. Yes. Comics think that, you know, I, for years, Tim Dillon, I did not quit snorting coke because I thought the funniness would go out the fucking window. Right. I thought it made me wild on stage and I thought it made me edgier on stage. It gave me like an edgier. It's like when somebody takes a picture with a cigarette in their mouth. Right. Yeah, they're you know like what saying? They're, they're trying to look edgy or will they take a yeah. picture with a Budweiser in their hand with somebody else yeah. with a Budweiser in their hand. Right. It's the same thing. When you're doing comedy, I mean if you're a young comic and you're snorting or doing pills, I'll tell you what, and you're having a good time, I ain't mad at you. But if you really want your comedy to soar because I think the comedy blocks, I think the cocaine and the drugs block your heart from your mind, like you, to put your heart really into your sets. I mean, when I was doing coke, I really couldn't put my heart into a set. That's correct. It wouldn't go through. Like the, the my heart wouldn't go through. It would just be words. It's a block. You said block. it perfectly. It blocks you. And in life in general, that's what it does, right? So in life across the board it, it it blocks who you truly are your true capabilities your true potential from being realized because you you know you are a science experiment at that point you know you are different you're altered you're changed you're you're on a drug you know and, and you're you're being impacted by the substance so you're you're, you're, you know, it's a, you're, you're, you're an experiment. You don't know what you're going to do. And that's like when I used to hang out with, with, with people and I would see them and they would be using a lot of drugs. I'd go, that person is becoming the drug. They're not even them anymore. It's like they're, you know, little by little, whoever they are is, is just becoming a, you know, you just become like you're taken over by this monster and you just exist to get the drug. Your, your legs and arms are just, to get on phones and to drive cars to get the drug. It's crazy when you think about it like that. Your 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 operating system's hijacked and literally your entire day or everything you think about, everything you do, it's all to just procure this substance and do it. And it's a binary existence. You're either high or you're not. You're happy or you're not. And I did that for a long time and it's good to not be in that position now. 14 fucking years for me. I have no regrets. Right. I couldn't snort a line of coke now if you fucking paid me. I don't care if you right. forced me to snort it off the girl's pussy from fucking right. that hot chick that's like 50 years old that used to date Pete, whatever his name is, Davison. I, I don't care. I don't. I can't even imagine yeah. what it would feel like now. I have a hard time with alcohol now. Right. Since right. I moved yeah. here. I drank a fucking claw one day. Yeah. I almost had a fucking heart attack. Alcohol really doesn't agree with Uncle Joey. Yeah. Yeah, you're at the point now. It's probably like you have your weed. You have an occasional stop at Carvel. That's it. You know, you. we all pick our poisons, and thank God that, you know, yours are manageable. 
I like that you're a Carvel guy. I see you posting the fluffy the cakes. Yeah, if, uh, yeah, fudge you the whale. Fudge you the whale. Yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing better. It's the the best ice cream in the United States. I'll I'll, I'll you know I'll talk shit to anybody that denies that. It's fucking crazy. I was I was sitting with these parents. Yeah, and they said, "What are you going to do after the game?" I go, "This is about a month ago." I go, "I want a Carvel." And they go, "What's that?" Oh, and I go, motherfucker, you grew up in Newark. You don't know what the fuck Carvel is? Yeah. And he's like, nah, we go to a place called Sundays. I, listen, that's done. Yeah. That's, that's done. True. We're Carvel um, people. I'm fucking Team Carvel, cocksucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with yeah. Tom Carvel since 19 fucking 73. Yeah. You know, I've been yeah. running with Carvel. How are you going to break? I, my loyalty is fucking Carvel. But I saw on your Instagram, you always post them when you're on the East Coast. When I'm on the East Coast, that's my it's my favorite thing to do when I get when I get on Long Island. That's it. I mean, it's like that was when we you were growing up in Long Island. If you were good, you you got Carvel. You know, your parents would go. If you were good, you could get Carvel. That's how they would bribe us. They'd go, "We'll go to Carvel. Just behave. We'll go to Carvel on the way home. Just shut up." And you would have to behave for the day, and then you would get Carvel on the way back. And that was how they just kept us alive. I got to tell you what, Tim Dillon, I know you're a fucking professional. I don't mean to bring this up. I know you like your food. Where I'm living in South Jersey, believe it or not, you know me, I'm a fucking loyal follower to Carvel. Yeah, right. But there's a place on the nine in Freehold called Jersey Freeze. Not fucking bad, Tim Dillon. Okay. Okay. Not fucking bad. I went the last time I was there, as I was pulling in, Bruce Spring Springsteen was pulling out. Really? People were chasing him with cameras and shit. I'm like, what the fuck just happened? Wow. And they're like, you missed Bruce Springsteen. I'm like, holy fuck. Yeah. I saw him in the fucking Jeep pulling out. I, I, I thought it was him. Yeah. And I saw like three little fucking homeless people chasing him and shit with cameras. Yeah. And then I went to eat the other night. And they're like, you see that gym right there? Bruce Springsteen works out there. There's these fucking restaurants down here from people from Staten Island that have relocated. Italians, they got everything here, Tim Dillon. Bagels down here. Yeah. You got Wawa. You got some tremendous pretzels. I'll <laughs> blast one of those in olive oil at night when I'm stoned. Who yeah. the fuck eats a pretzel with olive oil? Uncle Joey, cocksuckers. So when you wake up in the morning, your shit, it comes out like a fucking missile out of your asshole. No pushing, no fucking gurgling, no nothing. You, it's it's ten times, the East Coast is just ten times better food than LA. My God, it is so fucking good. Yeah. It is so gotta good. Be careful. Yeah. The Chinese yeah. is off. I got a Chinese place uh, 80 yards from my door. Yeah. She's yeah. always busy. Her name is Lily. Yeah. She's fucking tremendous. Yeah. Every time you go down there, she gives you something for free. Right. Like if you order 20 bucks worth, she throws in fucking cream cheese wontons or right. yeah, egg yeah. drop it's soup. It's, it's a different fucking world, Tim Dillon. Tim, yeah. how long have you been doing comedy for now? I started in this, the fall of 2010. So the late, late summer, early fall, late August, uh, like I think August 25th might have been my first set in 2010. So 11 years. 11 years, yeah. Congratulations on all your success. At oh, the 11 you, year I mark, at the 11 year mark, I was still getting buried at the fucking comedy store. Yeah. Well, it was a quick 11 years. It was an intense 11 years. Um, but it was also looking at you guys. You guys were the blueprint. You guys had the blueprint, right? You and Joe and Segura and Bert and Theo. You guys had the blueprint of what to do and, you know, do these shows and entertain people on the Internet and get a fan base and then go out and entertain them live. It was like that blueprint was something that helped me dramatically. And I thank all of you guys. And then all of you guys being good to me and having me on the shows, it, it sped up that period of time. It it. It made me, um, you know, it made me um, aware of how difficult it was probably to start these things when there was no blueprint and you guys didn't know what these things were going to be. You know, Rogan started it 2009 early. There was a lot of people starting this early when people were like, you're crazy. You're crazy doing shows online. You should be doing television. You should be doing movies. But a lot of you guys pioneering this stuff early allowed people like me to go, Oh, this is the way to do it. This is the route. And then my, everything that's happened to me, I think was accelerated because of you guys, because I was able to like follow in the footsteps of you guys. I got to be honest with you, Tim. I just watched Mark Marin. Yeah. I watched Joe Rogan. 
Yeah. I watched Ralphie May. Yeah. And I put that together. That yeah. was my, you know, I looked up to Rogan. Like I said in one of the podcasts, he was like my lighthouse. Yeah. Like if I'd see him, I knew where I was at. You right. Know? right. And I saw Mark Marin do a great job with the podcast. And I just wanted to do something different. I always wanted to do radio, but I didn't want to do radio. Right. That that style of radio, it's Joey Diaz here in the morning. I didn't like that shit. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to rap, you know, like I wanted to just talk to somebody on the radio. Yeah. Like I wanted to do a little bit better than talk radio. When I first saw Artie Lang on Howard Stern, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, that was the perfect. For me... Artie Lang and Stern were the fucking blueprint. There was one particular show when Artie had the sunglasses on and he's fucked up from the night before. And I'm like, I want to go on there and tell cocaine stories yeah, yeah, yeah. the way Artie's telling stories about fucking heroin. Yeah. That was it for me. Artie was the, the Lenny Bruce of the microphone, you know, in a studio. Right. He was very open with his life, copping, hookers. I heroin getting beat up by Dr Artie Lang. I thank him for letting me know what to do on a podcast. Yeah. Which he was, was tell your stories and tell the truth and don't hold nothing back. Right. That's what makes for good podcasting. With Rogan yeah. and those guys, it's intelligence. You know, his 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 thing was intelligence. I couldn't match his intelligence. Right. But I could fucking match stories. Yes. You know, right. I grew up in Jersey. I had a great childhood. I had a horrible childhood, but I turned it into a great childhood with my stories. Yes. And yes. that's what it was for me, you know, basically just. Uh, Do you doing... miss Los Angeles at all ever? Is there anything about it you miss? The insanity of it, the craziness of it. That's what I miss sometimes. I missed the comfort that I made for myself. Right. I took Studio City. And I created it, my little haven. I had cryotherapy. I had my weed store there. I had my jujitsu there. I had my weightlifting there. I, I pretty much made those restaurants my life. The Chinese place on Ventura, which right. is now closed because of COVID. The weed store, ice cream shop. There were a couple places. You know, my life was too comfortable, Tim. Tim. Right. Right. I don't know if I could explain that to you. It was, I had this little world. My office was two blocks from my house. You know, all my friends lived in the area. Lee, D'Agostino, Dean Del Rey. We were right. Burt Kreischer. We were all condensed in there. Felicia. So I miss that. Right. I don't miss getting lied to, getting approached with bullshit stories. Right. You know, I don't miss any of that shit at all. I yeah. do miss. There's a few people I miss. There were some good fucking people out there. But there was also some pieces of shit out there. Like worse oh, than God. what I did prison with. Yeah. Like people who come to you with a smile, they're worse than the cats I did time with. Right, right. Yeah, you're not kidding. They're no. pieces of shit compared to what I did time with. You know, yeah. at least when you do time, yeah. you know where you stand, you know. You had uh, a great line about people in LA once. You said to me, you go, you go, you go their minds aren't even their own. No. Which I thought was a brilliant way to say it. Their minds aren't even their own. Great. They sell their soul, yeah. and then they sell their mind. And you start acting like that, Tim, without knowing. Right. It's not their fault. Right. They're on a TV show. They're making 20 grand an episode. Right. They're fucking, you know, this is the first time people come up to them and talk to them. Right. So they want to fit in, you know. So they'll say whatever to fit the fucking even of of like uh, current issues. Right. Like, you know, oh, please save the black people. How many times have you had black people in your house? Right. Cut the fucking shit out. Right. When I go right. to your house and I see black people in the, in the fucking backyard, when right. I'm not talking about, you know, a black dude that thinks he's white. I'm talking about Leon and fucking Boo Boo, you know, and the cousins and the fucking dreadlocks. When I see them in your backyard... Then come to me and talk about Black Lives Matter. Right, Until right. that time, you're just agreeing with everybody else. You right. see him at fucking parades. You know, I care about black people. No, you don't. No, right. you don't. No, you don't give a fuck about black people. You know, you went to one Michael Jackson concert, and that's it. That's I it. went to see Earth, Wind, and Fire. 
You know, I've been black since I came from Cuba. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, yeah. these motherfuckers will come to you. Oh, well, you got to stop with the black people and the rest. No, because you're not fucking helping out. Right. The biggest thing about this pandemic to me was that you had to get your house straight. That right. was the number one rule I was taught. Get your house straight. How you act outside is how you got to act inside. Yeah. But if you're going to come home, you know what people say when behind closed doors. That's what I want to hear from your fucking mouth. Right. I'll bug your house and listen to all, those Negroes in Studio City scared me. You know, we went down to Orange County. We were surrounded by Philippines. We smelled pigeons. That type of shit. Right. That right. type of shit. That's what I want to hear. I don't want to hear you say how you love people because you really don't. Right. You want to hear honesty, the truth. You really don't. And I could tell when you're bullshitting. I could tell when you're bullshitting. Oh, rest in peace. You were a kind soul. No, you weren't. You were a fucking scumbag. You right. stole me 25 bucks from that gig and veil 10 fucking years. You know, that's what pissed me off, that you lose your mind, not in a bad way. People have a public a self way. and a private self. Yes. And, and, and I think the more and more those two things become further apart from each other, society gets really fucked up. People yes, tend to, people tend to, they're only honest with their friends. And then when they go outside, they're, they're saying what they think they have to say. And then everything gets fucked up because most people just go, well, I don't want any problems. I don't want anything. And so then whatever is happening publicly, Whatever we decide publicly is the truth is just a few people deciding it. And then the vast majority of people keeping their mouth shut because they don't want to fucking, they don't want any problems. And then they go into their house and they go, can you believe this? This is bullshit. I hate this shit. Can you imagine they're saying this is this? That's fucked. But you catch them out. They go, nah, nah, nah. and they don't ever say anything so then you have a few people in, that decide how everything's going to be for everybody. And that's what, and I, I feel it even with myself and I talk so much shit all day, all week, everything, but like, there's a lot of things where I go, you know what? I don't want to even get into the argument. Like, I don't want to get into the argument. I just want to live. I don't know how many years I have on this planet. Why am I going to have the argument? It's a, it's a natural thing that happens to people. They just go, I'm tired. I'm tired. I don't want to get into the argument. You want to believe that? Believe it. You believe it. I'd be insane. It's insane to me. But you believe it. So it's a, it's a weird place we're in right now. I don't, I, I, the country feels weird right now. And I remember me and you had a talk about this a, a few months ago. It feels weird. There's a there's something that's not being said. There's a lot that's not being said, but we're not where we were uh, clearly before this pandemic, before all this stuff. A lot of people out there have a lot of anxiety. They don't know what's happening. They don't know the direction that things are going. And I feel like um and it's not political. It's none of that shit. It's not like this one's right and that one's wrong. It's just I feel all of us, we have this ominous feeling that, God forbid, another shoe's going to drop or something else is going to happen. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's scary. I mean, nobody expected the Afghanistan thing. Right. Nobody saw that coming. You know, uh, I'm not a political guy. Right. But I know that this week, that's been the big fucking issue. You know, when I speak to people, I keep my mouth shut. I listen. I learn. I don't really know what's going on over there. But one thing I will tell you that I am proud of about L.A. The last 10 years I was in L.A., I didn't hold anything back. Right. You know, when I shot movies or TV shows, one of the hardest things I had a problem with was shooting TV shows and movies. Right. I don't right. like the behavior of some people, how they act right. phony and shit. When I went, when I got off the powder, I went on a headhunting fucking ordeal. And then he, sh and he said I went to, if I could tell who the director is, I don't want to be on that set. Right. Like if I get on the set and he's got a little hat with a feather in it right. and his sleeve is rolled up to show the tattoo of the parrot, right. you go fuck yourself. You're not really a fucking director. You know what I'm saying? Like it was just, so I had a lot of problems. I was told a lot of times, I was tough to work with just because I would speak my mind. Right. 
you know, and uh, I'm really proud of that because from 97 to 2007, when I was doing coke, I wouldn't speak my mind right? because God forbid you break up my little cocaine den and my dreams, you know, I'd rather right. not argue with you. Like uh, there was a, a situation I talk about with Tommy at the store with him and another comic came up to me and gave me shit about Joe. And I went home and didn't register that they were picking a fight with me. Right. If I would have known what I know now, I would have put both of them through the fucking wall, but I didn't. And part of the reason was, Tim Dillon, my cocaine habit. Right. Right. I didn't want to fuck up that little world, you know, go to jail for two days, three right. days because you smack somebody. Right. Once I got off the coke, I, 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 was, I remember the, I still remember the first time I went on a commercial shoot and the director was being a dick to me. And I go, I'm not taking this. Not tonight. It was a night shoot. Right. And I fucking went off on him. And he was so pissed. He fired me and locked himself in his trailer. And he wouldn't come out. He kept saying, until you're gone. I'm like, it's 3 in the morning. You're not going to hire somebody else to shoot this. Right. Come out. Be a man. Apologize. Right. Let's shoot this. And we'll wrap up and go home. And now you got you got the Saints of Newark coming out. Yeah. No, but that, I had no problems on that. That was a New York shoot. Right. See, Tim Dillon, there's a, what I learned was there's a big difference yeah. between an L.A. shoot and a New York shoot. Right. New York sets are closed, and they don't play that agent shit. Yeah. Where your right. agent shows up and gets a free meal, right. and right. I came to check on you. Get the fuck out of here. You didn't right. come to check on me. You yeah. came to get the fucking free meal, cocksucker. And you our, know. our agent will get three free meals a day. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so I don't, I didn't want that. Yeah. But shooting in New York, I just shot something for Apple a few months ago. Fucking painless. Yeah. When I got the rules, they sent me rules, Tim Dillon. Right. <laughs> I was like, this ain't going to work. Uncle Joey don't do good with rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But once I got there, it was smooth. And that's what I, I'm really proud of that. That I really, st you know, like I would call a comedy club and, I would, and Justin would call me back and go, uh, they said that they can't book Dean Delray because they already have a feature. And I would go, well, then tell them to give me a week with there's no feature. Right. We'll simplify it. Why fuck around? If they already got a feature, right. let them stay and bring another headliner in. Headliner too, and yeah. then that was my way of saying either you're in or you're fucking off the boat. Right. I'm right. bringing him. I don't give a fuck who you booked. You should have known better. Right. So it was like, I didn't take shit. Like, I was like, no, I'm not taking shit. And that freedom was what got me to where I had to go. Yeah. Once How you break that, those self binds, that New York shoot was, I'm sure that was a great experience doing that movie. It was one of the best experiences of my life in the entertainment business. Yeah. Because I learned something. I learned something from David Chase. I learned how to get comedy from quiet. He's the master of getting comedy from a quiet room, a look. I tried to bring our style of stand up on that set. Right. And the first day I realized it wasn't going to work. Right. That style of stand up was not, he was doing something completely different. And right. when I saw what he was doing, it blew my wig off so much that I had to join in. I had to join Scientology. Right. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like I became one of his fucking guys. Like I'm like, I understand what he's trying to do. I never worked for somebody that had a plan like that. I've worked with some great people, some great directors, but he was brilliant tim yeah you're right about that when you watch the sopranos you see a lot of the funniest moments are looks reactions things like that he really taught me about looks reactions and quiet how you have to say a joke and shut the fuck up right. let it ruminate in the room let it go you know like when you did theaters at first yes people say to you theaters are different you know you have right. to say the joke and shut up and let it ruminate the room is big yeah. it's a fucking theater just machine gun them to death but it's that's what I learned in New York at 56 years old. So when I learn something, I'm in. Right. I'm one of those guys. If you got something to teach me, I'm fucking in. Right. That's important. It's important that you keep challenging yourself to be better because otherwise you get bored. You get bored. You, you know, know, and that's bored. what happened with me with stand-up right now. I'm a little bored. I'll give it a breather. I'll let all this shit pass us. Yeah. And when I'm ready, I go on there with a base, you know, like you want to do it. There's I, nothing worse than doing comedy and not want to do it. 
That's There's true. nothing worse than showing up there and going, I didn't want to fucking work tonight. Right. You know, and I had a lot of those the last couple of years, so I figured I'd give it a little breather. Let Tim Dillon take over the fucking world. Well, we'll see. Few years, but Tim Dillon I'm, I'm out there having the fun and trying to, trying to do the best that I can. And uh, you guess I got sidelined with this thing for a minute, but I'll be back up. It's like, it's shitty. There's so much out there you don't control. You know, and I'm on a, on a roll. I'm on a roll. I'm doing shows and shows and shows. And then you get hit with this and you go, you fucking health. And then you're like, fuck, this is what you don't have any control over. Well, Tim Dillon, I feel in my heart that this is just a bump in the road for you. Yes. You have a great fucking plan. You're one of those comics that's very intelligent, that sees things for what they were, for what they are, not what they were. Thank you. You know, just what you told me about the spring, that everything should be, you know, you're all, you've always been very knowledgeable. And I'm right here clapping for you, waiting to take over the world, my friend. Well, let's hope. We'll see. I mean, I don't know if I want the world. I don't want to take over the world. I want to make a few people laugh and make some money. But everybody That's- else can have the world. The world is, is a little bit of a mess. That, that uh, Taylor Tomlinson can have the world. She'll do a better job. <laughs> Just give me a little corn. Just give me some Carvel. That's all. You know, yeah. I got to tell this Tim Dillon story real quick. I was watching one of your videos. Everybody was telling me about Tim Dillon. I'm watching one of your videos two, three years ago. I'm laughing. And I see you a week later at the store. And I'm like, what the fuck is this guy going to say? And yeah. you came up. You're the sweetest man in the world. You were like, hey, Weight Watchers work? And I'm like, yeah. And that's how we started talking. I'm like, out of all the things Tim Dillon could have said to me, he's like, yeah. hey, Weight, Weight Watchers working for you? I go, yeah, you know, I like it. I've been on it. Yeah. fucking 18 years i finally lost some weight and shit i love it yeah yeah I, have you done it during the pandemic and not really yeah yeah i stuck to my points during the surgery oh wow when i had knee surgery knee replacement i couldn't do anything i had no metabolism so yeah i stuck Smart. to the fucking points you know and i eat i just don't fuck with sugar right i'll eat sugar maybe once a week like a snack right. with my daughter when we go to carvelos and i'll get an ice cream soda without ice cream in it right I'm one of those fucking jerk offs, you know. So, how do you do ice, that? What's that? Ice cream soda without ice cream. What do you mean by that? They, when she gives me the ice cream soda with the ice cream in it, I take it out and I give it to my daughter, and she puts oh. it in her chocolate ice cream soda. Oh, okay. Yeah, she likes right. the ice cream in her soda, so I give it to her, and I just drink the fucking thing, and it's like twenty points, but it's really club soda with vanilla syrup, so. Right, right, right. You're not going to fucking die. You know what I'm saying? What's the name yeah. of your tour, Tim Dillon? Uh, the tour. I think we're going to call it the post-apocalyptic tour. I like it. When does it kick yeah. off? Well, we, it was it was happening, and then we got we got kicked back in with COVID. <laughs> it should kick back off soon. We're hoping. We're seeing, we're seeing uh, when we can get back out there. Well, I love you, Tim Dillon. I I'll love see you. Thank you, you for I having me, I saw you buddy. posted... Uh, uh, dates for the Beacon Theater? Yes, Beacon in New York City what in November. Date? I'm pumped about that. Okay, I'm going to come see you and say hello and yeah, give absolutely. you some fucking love if the numbers don't ruin it for you yeah. and the fucking face masks and the vaccinations yeah. and I all the know. bullshit. All the things. But I love you. Keep I in touch. You. Thank you, brother. Tell Ben I love that cocksucker. Yes, I will. Ben's He's a here. good man and uh, we we'll talk we soon. Did. We, had Lee. we had Lee come in Tremendous. and face him. One of the funniest things I've ever done, I think. What was the look on Ben's face? I saw it, but my glasses didn't let me see the full effect look on his fucking face. It's so funny when we had Lee come in there. We saw Lee in Boston, too. So Lee Lee came in there. We hung out with Lee. Yes, he told me. He's got a girl. He's doing great. So thank you, Joey. Thank you so much. And I'm excited to see you in the movies. Love you, brother. Stay black and I'll be in touch. Thank you for being on the joint. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Boom! I hope you enjoyed Tim Dillon. It was always a pleasure talking to him. He made me laugh. Uh, Like I said, he's the future of fucking comedy. And he was on the joint today to help us out, to make the week go a little smoother and make your day be fucking nice. That's what we do here. I'm not trying to set the world on fire. I'm just trying to come through on Mondays and Wednesdays, give you a fucking giggle. Learn, you learn something, and we move the fuck on. I'm not looking to be fucking Johnny Bananas of the podcast world. I'm old. I got shit on my plate, and I just want to get to you motherfuckers twice a week and let you know I love you. I'm still doing my thing, and I'm still here. I hope you enjoyed Tim Dillon. It was a great interview. It was great to see him. I'm happy he's getting healthy. I'm happy he's going back to L.A. 
and he's going to light the fucking world on fire. We're getting old, so we got to make room for these fucking youngsters. That's just the way it is. You can't take this shit personal. You know what I'm saying? It's your attitude, cocksuckers. But anyway, we had a great week. Monday, we had a great week. Today, we had a great show. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I'll be back next week, Monday morning, nice and early. Tip top Magoo, ready to tell you a story, ready to give you an ear beating. Then we'll be back on Wednesday with another fun filled podcast. I love you guys. Have a great week. And uh, the summer's coming to an end. Stay black. Now for a word from our motherfucking sponsors, Jack. All right, I want to thank Tim Dillon for coming on. I love that motherfucker. He's a nut. And I want to thank you guys for supporting us this week. My Patreon family, I love you guys. You know, we're trying over there. Thank you very much for all the support you've given me. You can see I'm making a comeback little by little. My mind's getting right. Uh, Some of it is therapy. Some of it is working out. Some of it is fucking alpha brain. But most of it is my balls and my heart. But anyway, the joint is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. You want a job? Every place is hiring right now. ZipRecruiter has a fancy technology that finds the best people for the job, and it helps you get them. It tells you who's most qualified and invites them to apply. It works. You're going to get two and a half more candidates this way. And any way you put it, four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Forbes magazine says gyms, salons, Hotels are going to go on a hiring spree in the next few months. Millions of jobs will be need to be filled as businesses keep reopening. How do you hire people fast? Uncle Joey's got the answer. ZipRecruiter. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Joey. You got nothing to lose. Here's the difference with ZipRecruiter. You're just not posting a job and waiting for a resume from Joe Schmo to come in. ZipRecruiter has fancy technology that finds the best people for the job and helps you get them. It tells you who's most qualified and invites them to apply. And it works. Get two and a half times more candidates this way. Right now, go to ZipRecruiter for free. Joey, what are you talking about? Four out of five employees who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day, and I'm giving it to you for free. That's right. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Joey, J-O-E-Y. Try it for free just by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash Joey. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. The joint is also brought to you by my all-time favorite, MeUndies. You want your nuts to be comfortable, you shave them, you put cologne on them from Manscaped, you got them all buffed, and now you got them in a white pair of fucking whitey cotty, whatever the hell you call those things, tidy whiteys. You don't need those things. Those things don't do nothing to help your nutsack or keep anything dry or in place. That's where MeUndies comes in. Let me tell you something. MeUndies are designed to be the softest thing on earth. That may sound like a fucking bullshit story, but it's the truth. Softer than a baby's butt. Softer than a feather. Me and Tim were talking about a Carvel cake. That's right. It's softer than a Carvel fucking cake. How? MeUndies signature micro modal fabric literally grows on trees. That means these undies are soft and sustainable. That's what you want when somebody's cupping your little nutsack. They offer different cuts because they're that cool. They get you different cuts for different butts. That's their motto. Plus, check out their socks, bralettes for your girlfriend, loungewear, and of course, all the undies ranging from extra small to 4XL for you little chubby people. MeUndies has a great offer for the joint listeners. For any first timers, get 15% off your first order. This is a deal in itself and free shipping at MeUndies.com slash Joey. Again, that's MeUndies.com slash Joey, the best underwears in the business. I'm going to take a picture of my fucking drawer and put it on Instagram to show you how many fucking MeUndies I have and how well they're used and how they look. There's no bulges. You know, your little white underwear's got holes in them and shit from you farting in there. Nothing like that with me undies. The material is tremendous, that mold doll. It's comfortable and it's tough and it's sustainable. So check out me undies problem free philosophy. If you're not satisfied with any product for any reason, they'll refund or exchange it. No questions asked. That's me undies.com slash Joey. Me undies.com. Comfort where it counts. 
The joint is also brought to you by CBD Lion, the leader in fucking CBD. I don't know about Martians. I don't know about a lot of shit, but I know weed related stuff and CBD Lion has helped me with my surgery with the CBD Lion Extra Strength Cream to the roll-on for my fucking knees and elbows and shoulders to the hemp flower if you want to smoke it. They got vapor pens they got little capsules they got tremendous gummies the mixed fruit vegan cbd gummies with melatonin oh my fucking god they will put you asleep like a baby and the bat ball i mean just go to cbdlion.com look at the third party lab results and read learn about cbd cbn cby and how cbd lion is the leader he's the king of the jungle so go to cbdline.com right now and press in Joey or Church and get 20% off delivered to your house. I want to thank ZipRecruiter. I want to thank MeUndies, CBD Lion, DraftKings for coming in strong this week with the NFL. Bet a dollar on any game one week and you're going to win 200 bucks in credits. You know Uncle Joey's here for you. On it coming through. All of you, I love you. Bowling Branch coming through. I love my sponsors. And I love you guys too. Have a great week. I'm happy you enjoyed Tim Dillon. Stay black. And we'll be back Monday morning ready to fucking rock. Tip top Magoo. Have a great week, cocksuckers. Come see me on Patreon. And Laughing Gas is back in stock at the ice cream shop. Stay black.